I told you tonight, this is the World Series of Mental Health, and I just brought in Big Pappy. I, I want to say what an honor it is for me to join all of you in this historic night in paying tribute to my great uncle, President John F. Kennedy. I also want to remember someone else who carried President Kennedy's torch for over the years, and that was my late father, one of Joe Biden's best friends in the United States Senate. Many people don't know who Joe Biden is until they get to know him personally, and I'm blessed to have had the privilege of getting to know this vice president personally. I've also been blessed to hear from my father about what a difference this vice president made to him when he needed a friend, not just a colleague. And so to Joe, we know you are known for your loyalty. And that's an admirable cause that anyone would be proud to carry. I want to let you know how grateful my family is for not only what you've done to honor my late great uncle, President John F. Kennedy, what you've done for mental health over the years, being an original co-sponsor, coming to our kickoff for One Mind for Research, fighting for coverage every step of the way, but on a personal level, what you've done for my family over and over and over again. Our hearts are with you, Mr. Vice President, and we consider you family tonight. Welcome home to the John F. Kennedy Library. Patrick, thank you very much. It's nice to be back at the Kennedy Center and uh, for such an important occasion. And uh, I'm proud to be here with, uh, with Secretary Sebelius and uh, understand my good buddy, and he is and was my good buddy uh, when he was in the Senate. I understand Gordon Smith is here. Gordon, uh, it's good to see you, pal. Thank you. <laughs> and. Uh, you know, I'll give you all a moment uh, to, uh, um, to get out your earpieces um, and tune into the game. The first pitch <laughs> was thrown out at 8.07. Uh, I was a United States Senator for 36 years, so I'm accustomed to not being taken seriously. And so uh, I, I will not be at all offended uh, at all. You know, I was thinking about it. Uh, your, your uncle, President Kennedy, uh, always believed that almost anything was possible. I was thinking about it coming up here. If he knew this was the third time in this century the <laughs> Boston Red Sox from the World Series, he'd know everything is possible. <laughs> everything. I was thinking about <laughs> his whole life. <laughs> his whole life he went without that possibility occurring. Look, um, uh, Fifty years ago, uh, um, President Kennedy showed uh, what is not unusual for the Kennedys, uh, real foresight, and uh, what is emblematic of the Kennedys, uh, incredible commitment when he signed the Community Mental Health Care Act, the, the Mental Health Act. And he vowed, and uh, he said, and I quote, prevention, treatment, and rehabilitation will be substitute for the interest of confining patients in an institution to wither away. It was a pretty bold vision, uh, and one that fundamentally changed the course of our nation's approach to mental illness, addiction, and intellectual disabilities. But it, I think if he were here today, on October uh, 2013, knowing, uh, knowing how far we'd come, what incredible breakthroughs that have occurred in mapping the human genome, using DNA sequencing and MRIs for disease diagnosis, uh, and so much else, uh, he'd, uh, he'd be using a different vocabulary. I think he'd be talking about precise diagnoses, targeted treatment, and complete recovery, supplanting what he supplanted uh, in, his, uh, in his statement 30, or excuse me, 50 years ago. Only now, I think, can we begin to understand just how much we don't know about how the human brain functions and the many incredible potential secrets that are contained as to how we may be able to fundamentally alter our way of life for tens of millions of 
people around the world. It's truly amazing what we don't know, and it's even more astounding what we might learn. I was sharing with your brother backstage uh, that, uh, and your sister-in-law, who is a psychiatrist, everyone in our business should be married to a psychiatrist. Uh, <laughs> I don't know how the hell it happens so often here in Massachusetts, uh, but, um, but uh, uh, I, I had a, uh, back uh, a long time ago, uh, um, I, uh, in 1988, I, I had uh, two uh, cranial aneurysms. Uh, and, um, and the first one uh, was the dicey one, but got through that. And I had a second one uh, on the other side of my brain. Apparently, roughly 30% uh, um, uh, of the people have one aneurysm on one side, have a mirror aneurysm on the other. I was lucky to be part of that percentage. And, and I remember being rolled down uh, to the operating room and many of you have had that experience, counting the ceiling tiles as you're, as you're heading in. And, uh, and I remember the doctor, Dr. Hart, my anesthesiologist, who was, they kept the same team together to do the second operation. And Dr. Hart, trying to be light, said, Senator, he said, you know why neurosurgeons have the biggest egos in medicine? And I said, no, doc, I don't know why. He said, well, who the hell else would go into the brain knowing as little about it as they do with as much confidence? <laughs> Um, pretty telling. But folks, um, we're in the cusp of uh, astounding, astounding, astounding possibilities. The way I see it, uh, there are two uh, main barriers uh, on our path to conquer mental illness. One is the limit of our knowledge about how the brain functions. And the other is the persistence of stigma who those suffer from mental illness who avoid seeking the treatment that is now available and could be helpful. For it's, a, it's a truly times, uh, as it's well past time, as President Kennedy urged, to move beyond the view of the time past that he quoted when he introduced, the, when he talked about uh, his legislation. He said, the mind of man is a far off country which can neither be approached nor explored. He was quoting someone from the past and say it's time to put that behind us. Well, what we all know, what Patrick and his organization knows better than anyone, and all of you who are devoted to this cause know, it is time to approach and explore in ways we haven't done before. It's time for the first time to map the only uncharted territory on Earth, truly uncharted territory, to map the human brain. That's why the President and I proposed, uh, it's not a lot, but $100 million to begin to do just that, to map the human brain. That's why private sector partners like Allen Institute uh, of, uh, of Brain Science and Howard Hughes Medical Institute and so many other leading research institutions in the world are making significant commitments to the critical resource needed research that's needed in the human brain. Imagine when we're able to identify the biomarkers for mental illness, able to accurately design treatments to prevent mental illness in the first place. In the year 2013, the brain is the new frontier. Just as President Kennedy could not have imagined that his moon landing would yield a semi semiconductors and iPhones, a, all the other things that came from that historic effort. We can't imagine the breakthroughs that are available and likely to occur as a consequence of the research and what the research may lead to. Mapping the brain may not only give us insight into the causes and cures of mental illness, but other disorders such as Alzheimer's and epilepsy. It could also help us find out how the brain interacts with the entire body, giving clues to cures for cancer and heart disease, uh, obesity, and so much else. And we're learning more about the brain every day. I found that uh, when I was down, uh, Patrick, I went down to the Intrepid Research Facility down in Texas and meeting with these young warriors who, uh, who were uh, seeking and getting fitted for prosthesis. And, uh, and I remember seeing this young man, who I'll not mention his name because I didn't ask permission, who I've subsequently seen on four occasions, who was there and he was being fitted for a, a hand, a, 
prosthesis, his hand, were actually from his elbow down almost. And he very proudly said to me, Mr. Vice President, come here, come here, watch. And he held his hand up and he turned his right foot out. And his hand turned out. He turned his right foot in and his hand turned in. He said, I'm curling my toes and his fingers curled. And immediately, someone from this two came up and said, you can take no photographs of that yet because that's not, we're, we're just experimenting. But think of what's already we found about ways to control prosthesis devices with only using the brain, the thought process, providing freedom of movement and even more promise for the thousands of wounded warriors coming home from Afghanistan and Iraq. The ongoing research holds great promise for tens of thousands of warriors suffering from post-traumatic stress and traumatic brain injury. We number, and I carry with me, I will not bore you now with it, the exact number of, every day I ask my staff to give me the exact number of young men and women killed or wounded in Afghanistan and in uh, Iraq, a running total. But the number of people coming home with traumatic brain injury and post-traumatic stress is somewhere probably around 300,000 who are gonna be needing help the rest of their lives. And their average life expectancy is another 47 years. But the research, the research that's underway is promising. The research which suggests that neural pathways really aren't stamped until our late teens and early 20s. Imagine what we may be able to do if we learn more about how these neural pathways develop. But better understanding how the human brain functions and learning to prevent and control disorders of the brain is only half the battle in my view. The other half is dealing with the stigma associated with mental illness. As we speak, there are treatments and therapies available to help those suffering from mental illness and substance abuse that go unused. Too many people in this country still suffer silently. Too many mental health problems for which there are treatments are left untreated. Too many young people for whom help is available still struggle at school, act out, suffer disorders like anxiety, depression, never get connected to the help that exists now that can change, literally change their lives. And as all of you know, I bet everyone knows someone suffering from one of more of those disorders. It's not only the individual that suffers, but the entire family. The entire family suffers. One of my closest friends in college, one of my closest friends in life, was going through a very difficult time with his son suffering from mental illness. I'll never forget, as I tried to help him, like every, your, your, your dad, everybody who had a serious problem, whether it was related to cancer or related to mental health, your dad was a repository of information we all went to. Who is the best? Where should we go? And I kind of inherited a little bit of that because of my own experiences. And so I was trying to help my friend. And I'll never forget what he said to me. He was a, he came to Delaware, we played football together. He was a big strapping, all city tackle, a major city in New York. I don't want to identify him because I don't, his son is, he's passed, but his son is still around. And uh, I was sitting with him, I said, well, Don, here's what I think you should. He said, Joe, I'm so frightened. And I'll never forget the metaphor, he said, I feel like my boy, he used his first name, is at the end of a string, and he's out there in space, and I'm afraid. Joe, I'm so god darn afraid that if I tug on that string too hard, it will break, and I will lose him forever. I will lose him forever. <clears throat> There's too many people who know that feeling who go to sleep tonight with that thought in their mind. Their child is on a string. Their husband is on a string. Their wife is on a string. 
and they don't know what in the hell to do. But they know if they tug too hard, it may break and be lost forever. You know, the number one movie in the country right now is Gravity. And if you watch it, it's compelling. The terror at the core of that film is simply the possibility of losing your grip, losing touch in slow motion, and just sliding away into oblivion. But there's also, it's also about the power of trajectory, how the slightest adjustment of a few degrees today can make hundreds of thousands of miles of difference 10 days from now. Well, it's the same in life. And so we need to do everything we can now to help patients, parents, friends, and loved ones change their course. And we all know, and many of you are professionals know so much better than I do, the earlier, the earlier help is available, the better the chance. Many of you joined the president and me for the National Conference on Mental Health at the White House. We brought together mental health advocates, teachers, principals, faith leaders, health care providers, media, YMCA, YWCA, many, many more. It was in the context of gun violence and what we were trying to do to deal with that. We brought them all together to discuss what we could do to raise the awareness about mental health and combat the stigma attached to getting that help. And I hope you won't mind, Gordon, but thanks to my friend Gordon Smith, you were there and you made a commitment then. Representing the national broadcasters, you said you'd step up and you'd help try to lift this stigma. You stepped up with OK to Talk campaign to reduce the stigma and increase awareness. Because of you, Gordon, there's already been 140,000 public announcements, and uh, there's over 100,000 unique visits to the website. And the simple message is, if you excuse this point of personal privilege, uh, I still don't know how you have the courage to do what you're doing, pal. Uh, extraordinary courage it takes to take a terrible tragedy that happened to you and your family and to uh, step up to help other parents avoid the same tragedy you confronted and the spirit and the agony you endured. But you're making a world of difference, a difference in getting the word out that there's nothing, nothing at all to be ashamed of if you're struggling with mental illness or your child is or your spouse or your friend. It's okay. It's, as a matter of fact, it's necessary to talk about it. It's okay to ask for help. It's okay to acknowledge that it's frightening. It's okay to intervene. It's okay to take a chance. Even our military, strange as it sounds, many times the military is in the forefront of significant social changes in America, like it was on integration and other issues. But I noticed when my son came home from Iraq after a year, my wife was, my wife was desperate to see him, but he went to, um, to Fort Meade. And, uh, and we couldn't see him. His whole unit was sort of quarantined for, I think, three days. And the reason for that was is a number of mental health professionals went, went around and talked individually to these guys, all taught to train, and women taught to be trained and tough, and to be tough and never complain, and asked them questions like, are you having bad dreams? Is your head hurt or anything? Telling them it's OK. It's okay to ask for help. It's okay. So all of you in this room, and you in particular, Gordon, as well as you, Patrick, have been working to eliminate the social stigma of mental health care. We've done the same with the structural stigma that resides in our health insurance system and has resided there for much too long. You've just heard from Kathleen. By the end of this year, we're going to take a major step towards uh, completing that vision when we issue the final rules implementing the Mental Health Parity and Addiction Equality Act of Equity Act of 2008 that Patrick and his dad and so many more of you fought so hard to get passed. And we made sure the Affordable Care Act includes mental health and substance abuse services 
as one of the 10 categories of, of essential benefits that must be covered by health plans and new health insurance marketplaces. So the work that you've been doing is making an incredible dif difference, and I predict will make an exponentially greater difference as we move down the road here. We're in the cusp of remarkable, remarkable change. As President Kennedy put it, mental illness, and I quote, affects more people, requires more prolonged treatment, causing more suffering by the families of the afflicted, wastes more of our human resources, and constitutes more of a financial drain upon both the public treasury and personal finances of individual families than any other single condition. Imagine, imagine how fundamentally we can change society and communities for the better if we make significant strides in dealing with mental illness. Imagine the impact on our local and national economies if we keep kids from dropping out of high school because of these issues, keep employees from losing work time because of untreated depression or other mental illnesses. Imagine, imagine more homes where parents focus on raising kids and building happy memories instead of worrying about how to navigate the world of the frightening unknown. Imagine more classrooms where teachers focus on helping kids learn instead of dealing with behavioral issues, where kids focus on schoolwork instead of being overcome by anxiety. Imagine how many families we can save the heartache and grief if we can identify and treat mental illness that too often leads individuals to harm themselves or in the most extreme cases, harm others. Ladies and gentlemen, in, this inaugural, in his inaugural address, President Kennedy said, in your hands, my fellow citizens, more than mine, rest the final success or failure of our course. Over here, here today, he could repeat that same, same line. It's in your hands. It's in our hands. It's in the President's hands. And I know together, I know together, we will run this course to its final success. The answers are there. The answers are there. It's making the fundamental commitment to expend the resources, attract the best minds in the world and in this nation to figure out that most unknown part of the universe, the brain. So God bless you all. Patrick, God bless you for what you're doing and may God protect our troops. Thank you for having me.